Well, good evening. It's a sunny, breezy uh, evening here, and I'm coming to you from the shrub area at Handy Andy's Nursery. I'm glad that you could tune in to this week's edition of What's Up Wednesday. I always uh, enjoy these videos and enjoy you uh, getting a chance to tune in and get some information on gardening in our region. In that region, of course, the regions of uh, Northeast Montana, Northwest North Dakota, and it's always a privilege and an honor to have you tune in either live or to watch these videos after the fact and, and get some helpful information about how to be successful gardening in our region. So uh, let's get right to it. I always like to post in the description the uh, kind of outline that I have planned and that of course begins with our weather update. I've been doing that now for uh, a little while and I, I guess I would kind of just like to, to talk about the weather once in a while. I'm not a weather man but uh, I don't pretend to have all the answers but weather is kind of critical and relatable when it comes to um, plants. And so we'll get to that just a little bit. Um, temperatures are kind of nice during the day. I don't know about you, but as I've said in previous videos, I really love fall. I love uh, nice fall weather. It's cool in the morning, it's warmer in the evening, and I just kind of can't say enough good about uh, the fall um, season. So uh, what you should be watching out for, of course, though, this time of year, we are approaching our around the beginning of our first uh, average frost date. So as I looked uh, on my weather app, I use the National Weather Service app, uh, a little bit ago before I, I went live here, I did do some looking, and the overnight lows here are starting to dip into the upper 30s. Uh, just below 40, 37, 38, in some of the nighttime temps here overnight in the days and week or so to come. So do be aware of that, do be mindful of that, we are into the time of year when we could be subject to some frost. So it could be happening. Uh, generally, our first frost date is usually around uh, the average is as early as the 20th of May, of, uh, of May, of, of September, rather. The earliest is about the 20th of September, and the latest is around the 15th of October. Somewhere in that window is usually when we get our first frost for the, for the season. So we are approaching that uh, number 20 uh, of September. And so do be mindful that it could be coming uh, before we know it. Don't see it just yet in the forecast, so don't be too alarmed. Still some time to get your veggie gardening done and get some things harvested. Uh, get your, maybe your apples picked and some of those other things. But, but do be paying attention to the weather when it comes to uh, this time of year. Because frost is on the horizon. Uh, it's a possibility. Um, that kind of leads me into a segue on the next thing that's on the, the docket on the list, of course, which is the water needs of your plants right now. Um, any plant that is under three to five years in a landscape, if you planted it this year, you planted it last year, you planted it within the last five years, I would consider it an infant. Consider it a young plant. Assume that you have to do some work taking care of it and, and providing the needs of that plant uh, for another couple of years, up to year five in that, in that space, okay? That's what you should assume for best success. And so if that's the case then, our watering needs right now, the way the weather's been, the way the temperatures have been, do not need to be every day as they were back in July and August when it was 100 degrees. We are comfortable now and we can easily be looking at a watering regimen of two to three times a week. Not a big deal at all to skip a day here and there. That's just fine. Do be sure that you continue that regimen until we get a hard frost. A hard frost meaning something down approaching 25. When plants get a frost that's about that cold into the mid to low 20s, usually it's a killing frost. That's what they call it, a killing frost, okay? And that means that the leaves are probably gonna start to color and or fall. Once the leaves are off the plants or they've started to drop as a result of frost, then we can start to cut our water regiment back. What we can cut our water regiment back to then is about weekly. And that weekly watering should occur probably until Thanksgiving. Some people are shocked when I tell them that. But if you want to be sure that you're going to be successful, watering and watering late is what's required in our region for young, young plantings. That's what did us in really in a lot of ways last year, uh, this past spring was that we had a very dry, dry soil. And the cold was able to move very deep into the soil and even things that were very mature struggled. There were, there were grandparents of perennials, old plants that people lost and that's why they lost them. 
when you have an 18% soil moisture like we did last spring when things started to wake up, the frost is just really difficult. It's, it's so dry that it almost cannot freeze because there's not enough water there to freeze. And so the cold just keeps moving down. It can be very hard on plants. So watering late and not necessarily as often like we, like we kind of have established. In the hot part of the summer, we're watering every day. That's June, July, and August. About September, that usually changes and we can cut back to our two to three times a week like we do in May. But by the time we get to that killing frost, late September, 1st of October, then we're, we're down to about, about once a week. But it does still need to be routine and it does need to be fairly uh, reliable for that plant. It will no longer be using that water once it loses its leaves. It will be more or less done using that water. And so that's the reason we can cut back is the water will not be used. We just still need to make sure that it's available and that it's there going into the winter months because we can't rely on snows or rains in the fall to provide that. So that's our, our weather update. That's our water update. I want to talk a little bit more also about um, my plans in the days to come uh, as we approach the weekend. Many of you have been in to get some good fall sales and some deals and you've had an opportunity to play Plinko for fall sales. You've maybe seen that advertised or heard me talking about that in some previous uh, live videos. That sale percentages will be changing as of Saturday morning. So those sales will be changing. They've, uh, they've been rather generous so far, 10, 15, 25, and 30%. We're gonna be moving those sales up. And so those sales will be changing, those percent offs will be changing for Saturday morning. So do look for that. And we, we look forward to having you uh, come in this weekend and, and find some things that kind of the, the optimum time till, still to be doing any outdoor planting. So we have not experienced our first frost. And so we're still at an, a good planting time. It's a great time to be getting some outdoor planting done. Anything you want to do that would be a year after year process, planting trees, shrubs, a lawn, all of that, it's a great time of year to be thinking about doing that. So we would really look forward to being able to help you uh, with anything that you might be looking to get done uh, outdoors in this, uh, in this season, um, this weekend, or in any, any time frame. So do stop in and, and visit us on that, but uh, our sales will be changing uh, this, this weekend as of Saturday morning, so look for that. Um, then I do want to move on, and I'm going to head inside to our classroom here, get to our featured topic this evening, which is tropicals. Houseplants, as maybe you're more familiar with them. Not as windy, and I don't have to talk or yell quite so loud in here, do I? That's okay. I don't mind yelling once in a while. But uh, here I am uh, in our classroom. Many of you have uh, been to see us for workshops in the past, and you might be familiar with, with our classroom space. You can uh, find that through the roll-up door. There's a, there's a greenhouse off to the one side. There's this roll-up door, and you come straight in here, come straight ahead, and you find the floral cooler. And you just look to the right of that cooler and you find this beautiful classroom space. And we do a number of workshops throughout the course of the year, but this is a really a fun room to visit when uh, winter comes because this glass door just lets the sunlight in and you can pretend that it's a tropical environment. You have some nice tropicals to hang out in and it's a fun opportunity on a Saturday to come and enjoy a, a warm environment and enjoy, enjoy plants with us. So... Um, I do want to get to some of our plant top, or our workshop topics that will be coming up, but I do want to spend just a little bit of time with you talking about our topic uh, that I chose for this week's video, and that is overwintering your house plants. Some of you have maybe chosen to have some tropicals in your outdoor pots. Maybe you've had a snake plant on the front step, maybe you've had a palm, maybe you've had some ferns or something in a planter that's been outside. And you're thinking, boy, it might be nice to keep that. I'd really like to keep that plant and maybe use it again next year. And that'd be just fine. Be just fine to do that. And now is the time to be seriously thinking about getting those plants acclimated from an outdoor environment to an indoor environment. You don't wanna just take, when that frost does show up here in another week or whenever that is, you don't wanna just take that plant and fling it inside and say, good luck. Let's not do that because there are many tropical plants that uh, don't like change. Maybe you're like me, maybe you're like them, and you don't like change either. Uh, but when you change conditions on plants, you can have a dramatic effect on how they're growing. I think particularly of uh, ficus. If you're not familiar with ficus, we'll go have a look at one out in the greenhouse here so that you at least get a chance to, 
to look at what a ficus is. I'm going to flip the camera around again. So here we have a beautiful Benjamin ficus tree. You're probably familiar with this plant. This is probably one of the more common uh, tropical plants. You see these in offices. You see them all over. Um, but Benjamin ficus, and all ficus really, in that, uh, in that genus, they are uh, temperamental a little bit. And what I mean by that is they don't like change, as I said before. And I don't like change either. And maybe you're like us. You don't like change. If you take a plant from an outdoor environment where it's getting all day sun or it's getting bright light and you bring it into a room and you throw it in a dark room away from the window where it's not getting nearly as much light as it was, it will struggle and it will not be happy. And if it's a ficus, like the one I just showed you, there's a likelihood that it will throw a lot of its leaves on the ground. It'll just drop them all right on the floor. And it will say basically, read between the lines. I don't like you right now. That's a ficus for you. Um, but if you wait on a ficus and you're patient and you make sure the soil doesn't dry out and you're kind of good to it, it will put on new leaves that are tolerant of that indoor light level. And it will get used to an indoor environment. But what I would rather see us do is help that plant get used to that indoor environment instead of just throwing caution to the wind and flinging it into, uh, into, the, uh, into the dark. So what we should be doing is we should maybe, that, that plant that we have outside that we're intending to bring in, when we get home from work, five, six o'clock, whenever that is, we should think about bringing that plant inside. And we should probably try and shorten the days on it a little bit. Leave it inside, but don't leave it inside indefinitely. Shorten the days. If you go home for lunch, bring it inside for an hour in the middle of the day. Start getting it used to a change in <coughs> light. Excuse me. Um, that will help <clears throat> when you go to bring it inside permanently. That will help it get used to a lower light level that is uh, conducive to being inside, which is really what we're after, right? And that can be the same issue. You'll, you'll experience the same kind of uh, dropping of leaves with ferns as well. So if you've got a Boston fern or Kimberly Queen fern that you had outside in an urn and you think you want to bring that in, you could experience the same issue if you don't get these plants used to coming inside, okay? So that's what I wanted to spend most of the time talking about. Obviously, if we are not uh, going to freeze, they're, they're kind of okay, but there were some nights that I was looking at and in the extended forecast when I watched the, uh, the overnight lows where we're going to start to dip below 40 degrees on some nights. And that isn't the most ideal for a tropical plant. Most tropical plants prefer at least 50 degrees. So this 48 that we had last night, I think it was, and some of that, that's not the end of the world. They're used to that. That happens once in a while. But when you start to dip below 40, now you're getting to what they would consider chilly. This is kind of getting cold for them. And so we want to think about, if we want to save them, getting them uh, acclimated to an environment that is more acclimated to indoors. So that's uh, some information on overwintering houseplants or bringing them inside. Uh, when you go to do that, I would wash them. I'd take a hose, put a, put a wand on there, and I would wash them really well. If you want to repot them, you can. Uh, just to make sure that there are no pests or there are no uh, issues in the in the soil, that's fine. You can sure do that. Uh, washing them will often help that. And then again, work work a little bit at a time at bringing them inside. If you have a garage, that might be an ideal place to begin because it's very easy to pop that door open and roll that plant back outside. If you don't have a garage, maybe your back porch or a sliding door or something is an easy place for you to begin or to do that process. Uh, think of something that's <clears throat> that's easy for you to uh, to accomplish. We don't want to make this hard. So that's a little on overwintering houseplants. I do want to get on to our plant showcase. I have quite a selection of tropicals in stock right now, and I want to visit with you about some of those items. So let's do that. So as I say, I have just, just a lot of uh, tropical options. This one is sometimes used as a filler in outdoor pots for the spring and summer months. This is Mullenbeckia, or creeping wire vine. It's a real dainty looking plant. Sometimes it's used in terrariums, but it does grow 
quite quickly. So in a terrarium situation, it often has to be cut back or pruned or worked with a little bit because it'll overtake the space. But Mullenbeck here, creeping wire vine, is a fun, fun plant. Doesn't need full sun, but it does like a bright environment, so a room with a window would be ideal. And water uh, as the soil is dry. And it's very, uh, really a very easy and carefree plant. It's not a difficult plant to grow. And it is uh, kind of a unique um, unique uh, leaf and unique plant. Could be put in a hanging basket and hung like this one. Could just sit on a table. As I said, it could, uh, could go in a terrarium. Whatever, whatever use you might have for it, um, wire vine is a unique uh, indoor foliage plant. So next one I have to show you is you'll be kind of familiar with it because it is a peace lily. And just about everybody is familiar with peace lily. They are the number one bereavement plant, right? Uh, for the, those uh, instances when we, when we lose somebody we love and maybe a plant is given uh, in memory of that at a funeral home, that usually, in a lot of instances, you end up with at least a few peace lily there. Um, and those are very, very fun plants. But this peace lily I want to show you is a little bit different. This is known as the domino. Get my camera moved here. The domino spath, spathophyllum. That's the genus for peace lily. And you'll notice this domino has some white striations to the leaf. So domino spath are not real common, but I do have some. It's really kind of an exciting thing. I haven't seen domino spath in, uh, in years, really. It's been years since I've seen domino spath. But they have the same flower that the peace lily, the common peace lily does. They have that white um, cupped flower. has a little anther in it like that. And I might have one that's uh, got some blooms on it over here that I could show you. Yes, I do. So there is the, the peace lily flower. And you can get these things to flower off and on in the winter months, but uh, most house plants don't do a lot of flowering or a lot of growing for that matter in our uh, region from the months of, oh, the first part of November until probably after uh, Valentine's Day or thereabouts. It just is too dark up here and the day length is just too short for these plants to do much growing or uh, production of flowers at that time. So it's not something you're going to see a lot of in those months. A lot of folks wish that there was because they'd like to see some flowers at that time of year, but it just isn't meant to be unless you're going to institute some so sort of grow light system or a system where you're going to provide supplemental light to those plants. Just not meant to be. The next one I want to show you two of them actually, are these two plants here. This snowflake aurelia and this other, it's a, it might be a Balfour aurelia, not really sure, one of the two. Um, but aurelia are a fun plant. If you've had a Chef Lara, if you've had a Chef Lara in the past, Chef Lara are, uh, and aurelia are kind of closely related. Chef Lara are in the aurelia family. So the care is very similar to Chef Lara. They like a fairly bright environment. They have kind of a waxy leaf to them. This one has kind of a ferny leaf to it. Very unique. And they like a room with a window. They like ambient light. They like filtered light. Um, they can go in a lower light instance, but they should not go in the dark. Uh, most of the time, if you put Chef Lara or you put anything that's an Aurelia in the dark, dark conditions, chances are the stem is going to rot on you and the plant is going to die. So it can go there for a period of time. Uh, if it goes there, you should not water it. If you're going to put it in a room without a window, don't water it at all. Never water it. And that's uh, the most common killer of indoor plants is drowning. We tend to overwater and drown our house plants. And the reason for that is they often are used to climates that are lower in light. They're used to the rainforest or they're used to a location where there's filtered light, there's lots of competition for light, and the, the plants above them have blocked most of the light rays from the sun, and we have an environment that's kind of dim as far as an outdoor environment. But what we also have is dry climates that have tremendous competition and lots of plants vying for that water. And so most of these plants are used to drying out between watering. 
When you do go to water your plant, you should say, is the plant dry at least two knuckles of my finger down in the pot? Two knuckles of my finger down in the pot below the soil. And if it is not, I probably shouldn't water. I should probably wait and water when it is dry because that's the biggest killer of indoor plants is drowning. The next one, we had some Moon Valley Pilia a while ago in here and they kind of went quickly. But this Apicia is similar. It is not a Pilia. It's different. It looks like Pilia, but it has kind of a fuzzy leaf to it. You can almost see that. And it does have, I wonder if this one has a flower on it. One of them that came this uh, this week, actually today, did have some flowers to it. They're almost done, but it's a kind of a, an orange trumpety type flower. Rather unique plant. They also should be allowed to get dry between watering. Most house plants, as I say, are used to drying out between watering because there are, uh, what causes your daylily to turn brown on the tips? Um, could be damage, uh, could be, um, could be damage, possibly. Um, stem damage or branch damage, possibly. Um, weather, po maybe, wind, something. Uh, but brown tips, I would just clip those off of there. It's not a big, uh, it's not a big concern. As long as large percentages of the leaf material are not turning brown, you're fine. So, um, that's a great question, though. Uh, then back to our tropicals, our, uh, Next one I want to show you is this Fetonia. Fetonia are fun plants. I don't always consider them entry level. They are a low light plant. A lot of times you will find um, our low light plants for house plants in the classroom area and in the shop area that I'm kind of spending most of my time in this video in. A lot of our low light plants can be found in this space as opposed to high light plants that are out in the greenhouse. Uh, that doesn't mean, though, that there are not some highlight plants in the greenhouse that can handle being in here. So if you ever don't know, always ask us. We're always happy to help you with, can this plant go in this space? So a little bit on that. Uh, Fetonia are fun plants. They can sometimes be used as a uh, terrarium plant or a, an indoor kind of a garden plant, too. But they tend to do best when they get a little bit dry between watering also. They cannot get super dry though. So if they get dry enough that they are super wilty, you will lose a Fetonia. It will die. Um, unlike our peace lily friends that we were talking about and are very familiar to us, this domino spath again, peace lily, you can let those things get really, really dry. You cannot water those and they will just throw a, throw a fit. They'll look almost sick. They'll just drop. The leaves will just go way down. You'll think I'm going to kill this thing. You water it and it stands right back up. Same thing is true for another common indoor plant, the spider plant. Spider plants are like that too. You can let them get a little bit dry between watering and uh, super dry between watering. You can go for a long time without watering your spider plant. And the leaves will kind of curl on you and they may eventually change color a little bit. They may turn a little gray, um, but you water it and it will perk right back up. So dry between watering is one of the big things we want to stress on when we talk about indoor plants. But we do want to make sure that we are providing the water that a plant does need. Um, the next few that I want to spend some time looking at with you, this one is a unique Dracaena. I believe it's a gold dust, but I don't see a lot of gold on it. But it has some real shiny, fleshy looking leaves. And it's a fun, fun indoor plant doing very, very well um, right now. Just got lots of beautiful growth on it. I'm gonna set it down and back away a little bit so you can have a, maybe a better look at this plant. Not a big plant. Not gonna get more than, uh, oh, 12 inches high probably at most. But a fun, fun, unique indoor plant for, for uh, kind of any light level. Dracaenia are pretty tolerant of light, uh, light levels and changes in light. They can tolerate a lot of conditions. They can't really tolerate total darkness forever, but they can tolerate it for quite a long time. Um, they are a pretty pretty easy indoor plant to grow, fairly entry level. 
Next one I want to show you is a fun one. This tall looking thing is known as a money tree. No, it doesn't make money. I often get that question. Does it produce money? No, I wish it did. Uh, if, only, if only it did, then we all would be set, wouldn't we? But it doesn't. This plant, you'll often find, has been braided. So there's multiple plants twisted together in this pot. And you can see that as I kind of flip it around, you can see all these different stalks. And if you would want it to continue like that, then when they were fresh and green and pliable like this, you would want to continue to braid them. Twist them and braid them in the way that you braid hair. And you would be able to continue to keep this stem kind of thing going up as tall as you'd like them to be. I have seen um, Picaria or Money Tree get as tall as four or five feet. Not a lot taller than that. That's probably about the tallest they get. I suppose that they could get as high as maybe eight, but I have not seen them that big. Um, but usually they'll get... Uh, at least uh, shoulder height in an indoor environment. Uh, and they're a fun, fun, unique plant. They do like uh, a bright environment though. Should not be put in the dark. Those should be in a room with a window, uh, pro preferably kind of near the window and uh, in some decent light. So um, Picaria or Money Tree are a very unique and fun plant though. Just a couple more to show you. We just got these in today too. These are, are minis, but they are fun, fun specimens. They will grow. They're mini now. They're little now, but they will get bigger. This is an adenium. Maybe you're not familiar with them. They have kind of a, a fleshy, set it down and focus the camera, kind of a thick fleshy stem to them and nice big leaves. They're native to, I believe it's South Africa, meaning the bottom portion of Africa. Might be native to Madagascar too, but they're known as desert rose. And that is the flower. And they usually flower in uh, bright, bright uh, environments, usually about May or so they can flower indoors if they're in a south window where they get a lot of good light. Um, but they are a succulent. They don't need um, much water. They can be allowed to get quite dry between watering. And this plant will grow. Uh, I had some six inch in here many years ago and they were probably, oh, nine inches a foot tall. And they, the last one, I think, before it went, it maybe got about 16 inches tall. They can get pretty good size in their native habitat, but in a container indoors, they're probably not going to get a lot taller than about a foot or a foot and a half inside. Uh, you'd need a pretty big pot if you wanted them to approach their native size, which can be as tall as uh, about six, eight feet, I think, um, and a big, big trunk to them. The next one is actually native to Madagascar, I'm pretty sure. It's a Madagascar palm, Pacpodium prickly pear, this has some actual stems to it that are spiny. So do watch out. This one will bite you uh, if you let it. I don't like to let it, but it's a fun, fun plant. I'm going to pull its tag out of there, and it's going to try and bite me as I do. But those spines will develop all along that stem. You see that in the picture. And this really is a fun plant. This one will get tall, too. It can get as tall as a foot, foot and a half, um, maybe two. Uh, but it will take quite a long time for it to get there. These are not fast growing plants, the desert rose and the Madagascar. Uh, they're very slow, but they do grow and they're fun to watch and they're very unique plants. I don't often have them in stock. So uh, when these go, I'm not sure when I will get desert rose again or the Madagascar. So if you want one, you'll want to come in and, uh, and pick that one up uh, maybe this weekend. The last one I'm going to show you is one of my favorites. This is a variety of Calathea. <clears throat> and Calathea are low light plants. I have a selection of Calathea actually in stock right now. We have a few to choose from. So I'm going to walk over to that uh, display and show you those. Here, let's flip the camera again. Calathea are really unique plants. They are low, low light plants. They do not appreciate direct light. They should be left in rooms with uh, filtered light only. There's a paintbrush calathea. Another calathea back there. So many, so many kinds of calathea. But they do not appreciate direct light and they do not like being uh, wet feet. They don't like wet feet. Kind of like their relative, 
the prayer plant. If you're not familiar with prayer plants, have some of those sitting next to these calathea. Here you see a, a red prayer plant, or maranta. And as I say, these are relatives. The calathea is in the uh, maranta, or marantaceae family. So they are re relatives, and they have a very unique uh, design. A lot of tropical plants are what are called monocots, meaning one cotyledon. And because of that, they grow similar to grass or corn. And if you think about that, the next leaf comes on the inside of the previous leaf, right? If you've looked at that or paid attention to that, you're like, oh yeah, that is, that is different. Um, most tropicals, a lot of tropicals, are monocots. Um, palms are monocots. So some people think, well, they don't get very big if they're a monocot. They're pretty small. Grasses and things, they're not very big plants. Oh no. Some of the biggest plants in the world can be monocots. Just, just uh, you'd be surprised. But what's interesting about um, calathea and prayer plant is that they do do that. They form their leaf inside the base of the previous leaf. And here you see that next leaf is all rolled up like a rolled up newspaper forming inside the stem of the previous leaf. It's all rolled up like a newspaper. And when it gets out like that and it opens, it will open up and it will look like it looks. But how can you tell when this plant is thirsty? How can you tell when this plant is in duress or it needs some attention? Its leaves do the reverse. The way they opened initially is what they will do when they're hungry or thirsty. The leaf will stand back up and it will roll up and it will kind of shrink down and it says, I am thirsty, do something. Until you kind of start to see that, the leaves standing up, you don't want to do much watering to calathea and prayer plant. They will stand up a little bit in, in uh, low light or at nighttime. They do kind of react to day length and, and do react to kind of nighttime light like that where the light changes. But usually if they're thirsty, they'll be kind of floppy too. Uh, so if they're stiff and they're standing up, they're probably just going to sleep. Probably just kind of looking like they go to sleep. Some flowers close at night, same kind of thing. So that's uh, a little bit on calathea and prayer plant. Those are fun, fun indoor plants. Do want to get now to just a couple of the workshop opportunities that we have coming up yet this fall, because we do have some fun workshop topics coming up yet this, this fall. This weekend, we'll be doing our fall frame. And there is still space in this workshop. Both the 10 a.m. and the 2 p.m. session have some space in them. And we're going to go have a look at the fall frame in a second. But that happens this weekend. Again, a 10 o'clock and a 2 o'clock uh, set, session uh, for that workshop. That workshop will be happening back in one of our back greenhouses. We'll be having that workshop back in the back greenhouse because we'll have our classroom area here set up for a wedding this weekend, actually. So that's, uh, we'll be relocating our classes back to one of the back greenhouses this weekend so that we can get ready for a wedding event that's going to be in here. So that fall frame happens this weekend, the 18th, and we look forward to having you join us. Again, there is still room in both sessions, the 10 o'clock and the 2 o'clock session, and you'll get a chalkboard frame and you'll get some items to uh, deck that out. So let's go look at our fall frame. So that's a sample of what you'll get to work with. And you can decide if you want your frame to go uh, vertical like this, portrait. Or if you'd want it to be sideways and be landscape, you could decide to do either one. Um, that's uh, up to you. But you'll be able to write a message on that chalkboard, because it is a real chalkboard, and have that on display for any fall event or anything you might have going on that might be, uh, might be kind of fun. So after that class... The following weekend, the 25th, we'll be doing what we're calling this Mossy Arrangement. Mossy Arrangement happening Saturday the 25th, and there's room in this, this workshop also. We would love to have you join us for this one. Uh, we'll be working with tropicals and indoor plants. We'll be working with some ferns, some other uh, plants maybe such as Fetonia, some um, Peperomia, some other things that might be fun indoor plants, and we'll be working with those and getting a chance to uh, design our own mossy arrangement that could go on our table inside. We could do all kinds of fun different things with it. A couple samples of that mossy arrangement to show you. 
So here's one sample, and it will include, again, some greens and some materials, and it'll include a couple plants. Here's another sample. And as I say, that workshop comes up on the 25th. That's two Saturdays away. Not this Saturday, that's the fall frame. The next Saturday, the Mossy Arrangement. Really would love to have you join us for that workshop. A lot of room in both sessions for, for that one. So lots of fun fall topics coming up. Uh, succulent pumpkins still yet to come. And a pumpkin centerpiece still yet to come. So do uh, think about going to our website, handyandysnursery.com, and checking out the fall class options. Our winter, I'm meaning our Christmas series, will be releasing soon. We were visiting about those again today. Got to get those out. Usually those will be released hopefully by the 1st of October, just in time for uh, registration for the Christmas season, which begins kind of the 1st of November or thereabouts. So uh, lots of fun topics still to come. We really would look forward to seeing you. Don't forget again that Plinko is heating up this weekend and our sales are, are changing. Don't forget to register for those classes. Come in if you're looking to do any outdoor planting. Love to help you uh, pick the right plant for the right place and help you be successful with gardening in our region. If there are ever any questions, always go ahead and, and leave them in the comments on the videos. Send us a message to our Facebook page or send us an email. Give us a call. We'd love to help you. With that, I'll say good luck and happy growing.